House for the left view. Occupy Fredericton occupied Phoenix Square for close to three months, a little shy of uh, a little shy of three months. Uh, January third, five o'clock in the morning, 2012, was when the city crews came in and forcibly removed the facility. Uh, prior to that, though, there were discussions with His Worship, Mayor Woodside, and during those discussions, a uh, proposal was put forth, and that was for Occupy to voluntarily dismantle their own facility. That proposal was brought back to the General Assembly, which the General Assembly voted not to accept, but to remain on site. So what the what has happened after that was that the, the mayor says that the reason why it was done was that all through this he was a very patient and reasonable person that uh, you know that he had gone that extra mile to accommodate Occupy and, uh, ha and has uh, publicly supported some of the ideas of Occupy however the facility was a no-go he gave the orders to take it down uh, and of course when he was questioned on that he, he said that well why we're not going to go to the courts the, the route of the court that Occupy had asked for, uh, for him to go to was that in other municipalities they had gone to court and the municipalities had won but there's one salient difference uh, that that is between Fredericton and these other cities and that is in Fredericton there is no provisions uh, that gave uh, to prevent people from staying on public property that's the difference between the other municipalities and Fredericton anyway local blogger Charles LeBlanc the following day interviewed Mayor Woodside on this matter and here's the interview. So what happened this morning, this morning occupied Fredericton? It's all over? As you know uh, Charles uh, we had uh, our final meeting on New Year's Eve which uh, was videoed and uploaded to YouTube. Uh, I think everybody had a chance to see it. A lot of people have watched it and uh, I, I had been asking all along for an end date when we could bring this to a conclusion. Uh, they made it abundantly clear on New Year's Eve that they had no intentions of leaving, that one fellow who now claims that that's his residence, he lives there and changed his address, said that now I have two more people living with me, one from Halifax, one from Moncton. Uh, I felt at that time that, uh, that we were not going to gain any ground and, and going any further with this wasn't going to make a difference. And whether it was January 1st, March 1st or June the 1st, they still uh, would not have been very happy with it. So. Uh, I told them that that was unacceptable and that they uh, had until January 1st and to remove their personal effects. Why not wait to bring this in court? Like they wanted to uh, say, okay, let, let, a, let a court, a judge, decide. Well, you know, uh, uh, the matter was taken to court in other provinces on the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Constitution and uh, they didn't win. I mean, it's only one charter, it's only one constitution, so, uh, you know, I think it's a real uh, waste of taxpayers' money to, to pay lawyers to go into a court uh, when you can work something out uh, between yourselves. Uh, you know, they may not know this, but, you know, I tried to, to, to help them, I agreed with their cause, uh, and I, I... You were patient, I, I will admit that. Well, I did tell them, and it's, it's right on the video that, uh, you know, that, that they were losing support. You know, when this one fellow started saying, this is my home, I live here, uh, I've changed my address, uh, you know, the, 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 the public support started to wane after that, and, and it didn't get any better. So they were getting away from their, their message of Occupy, and it was more somebody was taking on, you know, uh, they, had, they had their own, their own issue, and, and uh, that wasn't good for them, and I could see that. So uh, basically this morning uh, at uh, 5 o'clock with the assistance of one uniformed police officer, one? One. I thought there was more than that. No, there was one, one uniform police officer on the property who did nothing, who said nothing, who was only there in the event 
that uh, something would have happened to one of our staff or to one of the uh, occupiers. Uh, the public works people came in, removed the sign, and went to the door. How many workers? Uh, there was probably 10 or 12. Did they pay uh, double time for that? Or? No, no. The, nobody received any overtime. These people were on shift and working. Uh, the police officer was on shift and working. The, uh, uh, the public works people are on shift and working. So, no, it, there was no cost to the taxpayers. I mean, this is part of their job. Um, at 5 o'clock, uh, they uh, knocked on the door. Uh, entered the property uh, and uh, started removing all of the things that were uh, on the floor. Uh, the next, uh, while that was being done, they started uh, taking the tarps and taking the plastic off. Uh, the last thing that was standing was the, the wooden frame uh, that was pushed to the ground. Uh, Public Works had a small chainsaw. They, uh, they chunked that up and put it on the back of the truck, took their shovels, swept the property, and we're back in the trucks and left, and that was at about 17 minutes after 5. Uh, I talked to the protesters, uh, asked them if they wanted, uh, a ride. Uh, wanted a ride, if I could help them in any way. Uh, they asked about their property, and I said, well, I did ask you to, to remove it. However, well, we don't want your personal effects. They will be available uh, for you to pick up today. Uh, the fellow from Halifax was very happy. He said, well, in Halifax, it took a long time to get it back. And I said, look, we don't want your property. Uh, and uh, it should be available for pickup today once we determine where it's going to be. Where is it? Across, across, across the river? The guy from Halifax has already come in uh, okay. and he's already gone up and got it. If you have, uh, what you're supposed to do this, uh, like the cops, we're going to talk about the cops. The uh, Nick Moore, a reporter, journalist for yeah. CTV, he said the police told him uh, not to to stay across yes. the street. Yes. And if he dares to cross that, he'll yes. be arrested. Yes. Are you concerned about no. that? No. Uh, what I said to the one police officer who I was with uh, to to say because uh, two other police cars showed up and they were both parked across the street. I said the one thing I don't want is I don't want the public or anybody in here during this operation the media? for safety purposes. The media? Well, you know, the media, as I said uh, this morning, the media could be across the street at Tony's Music Box. But it was dark. Well, it's just as dark there as it is in front of City Hall. No, but you need a close-up, you know, they got the lights and... The, I think those cameras are quite capable of shooting from Tony's Music Box to in front of City Hall. We'll find Box. out tonight. Well, you know, here's what's happening. Uh, you know, somebody had said you should have had it videoed, and I said, well, in fact, it, it is. It, it was done. There's somebody. By, uh, by the occupiers. They, they filmed the whole thing. So you'll see that exactly what I said is exactly what took place. They, they got a shot of me standing there with the one police officer. There was no other police officers around. There was absolutely no, nothing said. I, I met with staff at 4.30 this morning. I said, I want it done respectfully, peacefully, and efficiently. I want you in, and I want you out. I don't want anybody hurt. I don't want any harm to come to the occupiers. And that's precisely what happened. The feeling about all this, uh, you're getting, uh, in, in Twitter, you seem to be a hero. Oh, good job. You're getting a lot of, a lot of support in Twitter. Well, you know what, Charles, I think, uh, and you've been involved in a lot of the sessions when I've been there, uh, I've done it just, you know, alone. Uh, I haven't taken people with me. Uh, I, that was I, pretty good, New Year's Eve. Uh, it was very good, New Year's Eve. You know what? You could have uh, walked away. I could have walked away, and I tried to walk away, and they called me back. And yeah. I went back, and I answered every question that I could, including yeah. some that were rather, you know, uh, anyway. I see that. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know what? I, I tried as hard as I could to set the example for the rest of the country, for both the city and for the occupiers. And on Thursday night that came, or on New Year's Eve that came to an end, and that was rather sad. I think it was wrong on their part. I think that we could have ended this with a press conference together that they could have dismantled and said, you know what, uh, the Occupy movement is, is not dead. We are going to uh, be going into another phase, and, uh, and whatever that happens to be, I don't know. And, I, and as I said to them, you can end it in a positive note. You don't have to be, have the public against you. So you're going to pass a bylaw, and then in the spring when they want, like you said, you don't want to start being like a barbecue and a hangout, like Officer Square I, years I, ago? I really uh, have... Uh, uh, you scared? You no, concerned? I'm not, no, I'm not scared. Uh, I'm not concerned, but I do not want anybody camping overnight uh, at any public space in the city of Fredericton uh, and occupying with the intent on taking up residence. Uh, we are doing everything we can now to strengthen our laws to ensure that we have uh, everything in place to prevent that from happening. 
and, uh, and I will do as much as I can to stop that. Uh, insofar as protests, I've said to uh, Occupy, you're welcome to come down to City Hall, you're welcome to bring your, your signs and protest. No more tenting in Fredericton. Uh, I think it's unacceptable. It's, un it's not only unacceptable to the elected people, Charles, it's unacceptable to the people who reside and who live here. Well, there you, there you kind of have it in a nutshell. You heard what the mayor had to say, what his rationale was, and what his anticipation is for the future. One, one of the things that really kind of strikes me is that towards the end of his interview, he says that they are now going to be strengthening or creating new laws, new bylaws, to prevent other people from doing what Occupy had done. And that was Occupy a space. Now, if you sit and think about it, that, that is quite important because is that an acknowledgement that he knew, the solicitor knew, the city engineer knew, that there was no provisions in place to legally remove the Occupy camp from Phoenix Square? Dr. Korky, in his lecture, talks in much detail to what the problem is, or what the problem that faces the city is with this missing provision. There is references in the letters, but there is no provision, there is no offense that's stated in the letter. And we'll see that in the upcoming clip. And here it is, Dr. Paul Grorke, Professor of Criminology at St. Thomas University, and he is also a member of the Alberta Bar Association. But uh, quite frankly, uh, I really, I mean, we need to hear from the city. The city has not been forthright about this, but uh, there's a piece missing. It's bizarre. I, I, as I say, I, you know, I would have in my career, I mean, I was on the human rights tribunal. You know, all I did was interpret legislation, was look at legislation and figure out what it said. What, Something went wrong when they passed bylaw T4, and they didn't pass. I assume, I, I, you know, I'm only speculating, but I, someone left something up, and it's a bizarre situation because it's very clear. There's no, I, I, I'm very interested to hear what the solicitor has to say about it, but there is a provision I gather that was supposed to be in Section Five which isn't in Section 5, which never somehow made it through into the official bylaw. And that provision, which is the missing provision, is what they were, uh, is what Occupy Fredericton is alleged to have violated. It doesn't exist. So what I did, I just tried to do it as simply as possible. It was page two. So what I give you is, I give you the, the Bible. There's really, you have to look at this. This is a standard legislative scheme. Uh, the way this works is, uh, it's basically an offense creating provision or provisions. Uh, the, there's actually two provisions. One is section five, one is section 16, 16 is the penalty clause. But the way this is supposed to work, if you look at page two and on to page three, this is, well, it's, it's a strange situation. But this is, uh, if you want a legislative scheme, that comes in three parts. You have, uh, you have uh, a part, a provision that says to the public or to whoever, you can't do this. Really, the, the, at its simplest, it's two parts. You tell the public they can't do something, and then you provide a penalty if they do it. This is a little more complicated because we're talking about private property, and of course, I know legislation, and they're concerned about, you know, the reason you got this three-day notice is that if someone's got something up somewhere where it shouldn't be, you have to give them an, a fair opportunity to take it down. That's, that's what's going on there. But that, that's really a very secondary uh, consideration or cause. The, the, real, the real heart of it is you've got a provision which creates the fence, and then you've got a penalty clause which says if someone uh, does 
what the substantive clause, the first part says you can't do, they get penalized. I, I mean this quite literally. The first part of the section is missing. Absolutely. The substantive clause isn't there. Now, what, uh, why? Of course, I, how can I know? Uh, as I say, um, you know, the bylaw must have been passed, it must have been transcribed. Uh, somehow, uh, I gather, and really the mayor needs to answer this, and the city solicitor needs to answer this question. Uh, uh, the city solicitor will be able to tell us why that part of section five, which they appear to have been relying on, never made it into the final bylaw. My guess is just a clerical error. But really, I'm not that concerned about that. What concerns me is you have a defective piece of legislation, you have a defective bylaw. Section five does not contain the provision on which the mayor was ostensibly relying in order to uh, order uh, 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 the protesters out of Phoenix Park. Now it's interesting, when you realize this, it starts to explain why the city waited. Probably explains why the city waited three months before they did anything. I suspect what happened, obviously the city solicitor is a lawyer, the city solicitor would be much more familiar with this uh, uh, legislation than I would be, but the city solicitor, I would assume, must have been aware. In fact, the person who drew up that notice must have been aware that there was a problem with Section 5. And that, uh, you know, what you've got is the critical piece of Section 5 is there. Well, this is law. Of course, you can't charge people with an offense or under a provision that does not exist. But that's what they were threatening to do. So it's, uh, it's, uh, now, why, uh, And in fact, I know the mayor made comments about, well, maybe we'll have to strengthen the bylaw. Uh, there's something missing from the bylaw. So if they, if they were going to somehow come under Section 5, yes, they first needed to amend the bylaw, uh, you know, go before council, amend the bylaw, put in the missing piece, and then you can. But, you know, it, I was trying to think of analogies. It's been something like that. And I'm mostly concerned legally about the goals. I have a very hard time understanding how the director of engineering had any authority to issue this notice. And the city moved in against the protesters on the basis of Section 5, and uh, it's, a, it's a very odd situation. I have not come across this situation before in 30 years of practicing law, but basically the city moved against the protesters on the basis of a provision uh, which does not exist. Uh, explain that. What, what's defective? What doesn't exist? The, the section five of the bylaw deals with, uh, uh, at least apparently deals with uh, installing, erecting, maintaining a, a structure. That's the term the section uses. A structure on a city property, on streets or sidewalks. But uh, the the part of the section that actually deals, I don't know what I can say to you. It's not there. There was a, obviously when the bylaw was passed, a mistake was made, there was an administrative error. I assume it was an administrative error, but uh, the, uh, the bylaw was passed without the relevant provision. There is nothing in section five of bylaw T4 which prohibited the protesters uh, from uh, erecting a shelter, maintaining shelter on Phoenix Square. And so, so the, but the, in other words, I'm not saying you, there's no, you can't do this. Is that what's not in there? That's right. So it's, it's the, basically, the, it's a legislative scheme. It's set up, it's an offense creating section. Basically it has, really it has three parts. One part that says you can't do this. Uh, a second part, which is you get three days notice. And a third part, which provides for a penalty if you don't do this. But that part of the provision of the section, which is intended to say you can't do this, i.e. you can't install and erect a structure uh, uh, on a public property. It's not there. The city of Fredericton ever in a pickle, a real dilemma here. Uh, they acted against uh, Occupy Fredericton who had set up a camp on Phoenix Square public property. Now all through this here, uh, Occupy was there for almost three months and uh, throughout 
the the the, the history is uh, you know the the you know the city was saying that they were more than reasonable they were very patient with Occupy but the truth of the matter was is that they didn't really know what to do with this particular situation unlike other municipalities across Canada that took legal action against their occupies, they had charter arguments which may have succeeded or may have failed in the upper courts. However, in the lower courts, those uh, municipalities succeeded. The Fredericton story is much different than that, is that there was not a bylaw to cover the removal of occupy. And Dr. Garork states that quite well in his lectures uh, to the legalities in behind that. So, to, to clarify that a little bit more, imagine that there are no legislations written about telling you that you cannot drive over 30 kilometers per hour in a uh, school zone. You're driving at 60 kilometers and you get arrested and you get ticketed for driving over 30 kilometers in that school zone. You get fine for X numbers of dollars and you come to find out there is no law that says you can't and that's the situation that the city of Fredericton is and that is possibly the reason why when Occupy Fredericton had asked to go to the courts why the city chose the avenue that they did because without that provision then you don't have an offense so therefore you cannot have penalties and and most likely, that is what's behind being reasonable and patient, is that through the court system, the city could not have succeeded. This is Andre Faust for the left eye, and remember, to always question, never take anything for granted, look under that rock, you'll find something. Thank you very much.